Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the organizers, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the G1 Global Conference 2013. We appreciate your taking, uh, taking time off your busy schedule to join us today despite the weather condition. My name is Tomoko Katsurayama, a faculty member at Globus University, and uh, I will be the MC today. To start off the conference, I would now like to call on Mr. Yoshita Hori, the conference chair who is the president of Globus University and managing partner at Globus Capital Partners. Mr. Hori, please. Good morning, and welcome to G1 Global. And uh, outside is typhoon, and inside <laughs> is peaceful, peaceful discussion. G1 Global Conference, this is a third annual conference. We started two years ago here in Globus campus. Last year we did in collaboration with World Economic Forum right after World Bank IMF meeting. And this time we are back into Globus Tokyo campus. The name of G1 stands for Group of One and Globe is One. Means there's not, it's not G20, it's not G8, or it's not G0. This is G1, Group of, group of One and Globe is One. The concept of G1 came to me about seven years ago in Dalian. Seven years ago, we had a meeting in Dalian, uh, China, in China, Summer Davos. And a bunch of Japanese delegates met with Professor Klaus Schwab. And I asked one simple question. There is a China summit, Japan summit. But why not, uh, there is China summit and India summit. Why no Japan summit? And his answer was, he gave me lots of reasons why not. And he said, why don't you start one? And that gave me inspiration to start G1 movement. We started G1 summit five years ago in Fukushima. And then we had one in Hokkaido. We had one in Nagano where Minister Hayashi came over, and one in Aomori also Minister Hayashi came over. And the one in Nagano uh, also Prime Minister Abe came as well. And we, had, we, been, we went back to Fukushima this year to, to the show support of Fukushima, people in Fukushima. Whenever we do conference, the language becomes an issue. We, when we do in Japanese language, we tend to exclude others. But when we try to use interpreter, we tend to have some, some kind of contents lost in translation. So what we have decided to do is that G1 Summit, we do 100% in Japanese, and G1 Global is going to be 100% in English. No interpretation. Everybody has to speak in English, and there will be no translation into Chinese or Korean or Japanese. Everybody has to speak in Japanese language. This year, we had a theme is uh, Stronger Japan, and impact on Asia and the world. Stronger Japan means when Prime Minister came into power, he started to have abenomics. And stock markets have gone up by 50%, 60%. The economy has grown, and we have a stronger corporate earnings. At the same time, he has started to assert more in terms of island issues and also in foreign affairs. That has also a strong implication to neighboring countries in terms of geopolitics. And then last week, we had the Tokyo Olympic 2020, and that has given ja Japanese people very strong hope, and we are so happy about what's going to happen. So this is going to be a stronger Japan, and we like to talk about various issues, including energy, and including foreign affairs, geopolitics, and also entrepreneurship, and so on. We have invited guests from 15 different countries, like from Germany, from UK, and from France, and the US, and China, Korea, and Singapore, and Thailand, and India, and also Kenya. We have quite a few diverse uh, set of people on the panel. We limited Japanese panelists to be less than half. So therefore, it's going to be a very global uh, discussion. And I encourage, I encourage you to uh, participate. And at the same time, Nick is trying to do a very interesting uh, way to, to be able to, for, for you to be able to participate by sending emails as well. So we'll encourage you to uh, participate at the same time. We will do everything on time. So I hope you uh, keep your time um, on, on time and punctual. And now we'd like to introduce the most, one of the most important speakers here, 
Miss Mr. Nick Gowing. Miss, I met Miss Nick quite a few times in Davos in other conferences, and I always enjoy Nick's moderating. I have a strong belief that he is the best moderator I've ever seen, and therefore I've been targeting Nick to be able to come to G1 Global. <laughs> And whenever I met him, I said, nice thing about Globus in Japan. And uh, I flew over to London and had dinner. And finally, I was able to convince Nick. And he, Nick has been moderating all the keynote panels uh, from the beginning of G1 Global. And we have been having a great time with Nick. So, um, so thank Nick for coming. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Nick Gowing. Good morning, everybody. Well, I hope I don't disappoint you after that, but really, I'm not a speaker. I'm merely here to make sure that all of you talk a lot and engage in conversation. The speakers are actually those who are named uh, in the booklet, uh, and uh, starting with the minister. And my job really is to say as little as possible, because I want to hear from as many of you as possible. And um, Yoshi's just mentioned what is up there. I'll tell you why I do this, because while you're sitting listening to the minister or to Robert or to anyone speaking, uh, sometimes uh, you might be frustrated that you can't yet get your idea out. And my experience in corporate conferences and certainly uh, what we do at the BBC is that people now, because all of you want to use your tablets and your smartphones, you're constantly thinking, how can I get a, an idea out there? So think of that as a way of getting a, a message to me uh, about what's on your mind, because th that'll help drive the discussion, because it's not about being prescriptive about what the issues are. It's about you contributing, whether you're Japanese or you come from any of the other countries that, that Yoshi mentioned. So from the moment the minister speaks, listening to what he says, if you feel inclined, please just send me a few words. Don't send me a, a paper or anything like that. Um, I just want to hear what your ideas are. And between me and Brian, who's sitting here, I'm going to create a grid of the kind of things that you're saying. Because what it allows me to do is work out what's clustering in your mind as critical issues, which we, we may not even talk about. Of course, it does mean that you can talk as well. And we're going to be uh, having this session until 10.30. So there's an enormous amount to get through. But please see it in the spirit of a conversation where I will say as little as possible, despite what Horizan has just said. Um, my job is to make sure all of you have a contribution uh, to make. And um, a reminder that the first session is a stronger Japan impact on Asia and the world. And what do I see? The first words literally in the editorial copy in today's uh, International Herald Tribune, quote, Japan is on a roll. So that is the message, but obviously there are qualifications and concerns, particularly over tax and other things. But how is this being seen elsewhere? And that's what we want to get to uh, in this next uh, hour and 20 minutes. So let's um, move forward immediately with the minister. Welcome, uh, Mr. Hayashi, who is the Minister for Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries and a member of the House of Councillors, formerly Defence Minister, formerly Minister of State for Economic and Fiscal Policy as well. Minister, the floor is yours, and please think of using your um, muted smartphones and tablets to send me anything <laughs> that is on your mind as the Minister speaks. Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nick, and good morning, everybody. Despite of the, this uh, big typhoon is coming, uh, this crowd is uh, more stronger than typhoon, I believe. <laughs> so uh, I, gave, I was given uh, 15 minutes from Yoshi so that uh, I would be very brief about uh, what I would like to talk about. And my uh, own agenda is uh, talking about the three allos, but... Uh, I think that everybody already knows about the three arrows. The first one is the monetary policy, second one is the fiscal policy, and third one is the growth plan. So I am not repeating that, those, uh, what is the three arrows. But uh, regarding these three arrows, I would like to talk about the three points. The one, the monetary policy, how we decided 2%. And then, the second, the second allows fiscal policy, rather than just talking about what the fiscal policy does, but how we been doing even before <coughs> the last uh, December's election to prepare for the future. In that way, I would like to uh, talk about uh, 
governance and policy making process of our government now. And also, the third policy, uh, third allies I would like to uh, briefly touch about the contents, but also uh, what will be the impact of these three allies to the world, and also especially in Asia, uh, as uh, Nick said. So first allies, the monetary policy. We set the goal over two percent, but this is not started when we won the last election in December. Even before that, three years ago, the upper house election, nobody remember that, but uh, we had a campaign promise saying we prefer to have some price target such as 1.5 plus minus 1 percent. And the reason is the downside, the 1.5 plus minus 1 means that the downside is 0 0.5. Why this is a positive figure, not zero? Then we said in that uh, campaign promise uh, book, booklet, that there's a CPI bias, so that the lowest point is or should be over zero. So this is already started three years ago. We talked about monetary policy, and also we hoisted that in that uh, upper house uh, campaign booklet three years ago. And then what happened in these three years ago, July, uh, the last upper house election, and last December's uh, lower house election. The two things happened. FRB started the price target 2%. And then ECB did the same, almost. So we thought that 1.5 was enough at that time before ECB and FRB decided in that way. But after those two dollars and the euro decided on that level, remaining in 1.5% is we saw that the might be sending a message to the market that we accept the lower targets than dollar and eurozones. And by that, maybe we are sending the message that we, are, we will be accepting the appreciating yen. So that's why we thought that leveling up the target from 1.5 to 2 will be appropriate for that the December election we face. And that's how we decided on the figures. So that's why the last December's election booklet says clearly that we will be needing the 2% point price target. And how we did and how it evolved already you know. But this is actually not the things that we just started out of nothing from that la last December, but we've been talking about that in these three uh, years plus. So, the second point, the fiscal policy. The supplementary budget is already passed this uh, February. But as you, some of you might know, that to prepare for the content and also the budget plan, it requires four to five to six weeks. So how we could do the budget making right after the elections? We introduced the budget plan already at the beginning of January so that we can do the parliamentary process for that uh, supplementary budget. Actually, when we are campaigning, you know, Please remember that uh, last November, uh, then Prime Minister Noda says that he will call the elections in the uh, Tosh Torong, which was what? Uh, party leaders debate. Chokuyaku <laughs> desu. But uh, uh, so that's why we calculated that since he called the election in November, voting date will be mid. December, and then we will be forming a government in one, one or two weeks. And if we starting preparing supplementary budget, it will be like February, March. So what we did is while lower house people busy, you know, campaigning by themselves, we, the upper house guys, 
uh, more freedom to go back and forth between the districts and Tokyo. So some of us get together in Tokyo to prepare for the framework of supplementary budget, even in November, so that uh, after we got the government, we could smoothly get into the supplementary budget making. And why we thought that we would be needing a supplementary budget? Because if we got a government in December, then the normal budget starting April has to be reviewed because it was made by former government. So we have to change the, that big, big, uh, almost the 90 trillion yen things to the new one according to our campaign promise, our agenda. So that might require months. So um, we could easily foresee that the main budget will be coming like late February to the floors. So that will be delaying the passage of that uh, main budget even in April or even in May. And actually which was passed both houses in parliament uh, after the golden week. So then what we need? We have to have a supplementary budget to fill the vacuum in this April and May period in fiscal sense. So those calculations already happened right after former Prime Minister Nuda says that he will call the elections. So that's the way we do, as we experienced in the government party for so many years. So that's why we foresee the process from now on to three months, to six months, to one year to go. So what we have to do now is to foresee them and then prepare for those kind of things. So that's what I would like to say in the second alloy point. So then the third alloys, five minutes later, right? So uh, everybody knows this is a growth plan and first alloy and the second alloy and the third alloy should come together. But what I would like to say is, this is not simply only aiming for Japan's growth plan, but including making up some uh, models. According to the former uh, president of Tokyo University, Komiyama, the, we are now, now means like one or two years ago, before we came in power. But uh, he said, Japan is the advanced countries for many agendas. We have to tackle so many issues, like aging, like fewer younger people, the long uh, lost decays with the deflation, and so many things. So, but uh, he said, if we have solutions for this, then we will become not the agenda advanced countries, but solution advanced countries. So every country, not only in Asia, but also in Europe and America, I think that we will follow this step. Might, United States might be a little bit different because the, that country will accept so many people from all around the world. But uh, you know, other countries such as in Asia, I think we will follow the same step as we came, like aging, maturing, and lower the gloss rate as we uh, <coughs> experienced in these uh, two, two decades. So that's why if we are showing some model, like we did as a developing nations, and everybody in Asia said, look East, look Japan. So this is not only we are revitalizing ourselves, but to set the example for those who will following us. So that's why this uh, solution advanced countries is the real aim of this uh, sad allows. So one example, the nasally care uh, insurance. So not so many countries already introduced this uh, nasally care uh, system. And we have the uh, universal coverage of health insurance, but to keep this, we have to, uh, oh, five minutes more, okay. That's great. Uh, the first we have this. That was just started when I was born in 1961. So 52 years old. So, but 
it glows and glows and glows to cover really national coverage. So if you have one piece of paper called the Kenko Hokensho, you will be going anywhere to be receiving so many good uh, practice from Japanese uh, <coughs> doctors. So, but to keep this in aging mode, aging phase of Japanese societies, you have to be very careful about the taking a balance between the premiums you've been paying and the tax get into that, and then the you're paying at the gate of the doctors. So those three things are the money. So every thing, every three items should be, you know, uh, a little bit increased, 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 but we have to bear with that. But when the society is aging, we have to, you know, get nasally care part out from this one to keep this universal coverage here. And then what we did is detach the elderly care uh, over 65 years old from this. So we have now three things, national coverage, elderly care, and then nasally care. So if nasally care goes to some program, then that will affect elderly care and then national coverage. So to keep this national asset, nasally care is really important. So we kind of uh, designed this, but it's very un, uh, un experienced. But uh, even the ministry people, Ministry of Health people, this is not perfect. But we have to start this, and we have to be thinking why we are learning. So this is a, maybe the first time in this uh, history of the Japanese bureaucracy that they admit this is not perfect when we started. So. We're still in the learning and thinking mode. So what we are trying to do is to have a second floor of nasally care. So the first floor means that insurance will be covering. But the second floor means you can get what would you like, what you would like to have on the top of the things that coming from the nasally care insurance. So that's why you are basically supplied, all those things supplied by the Nazareth Care. But if you need more service, like more better hotel system or more better food, then you can just pay additional cost. So, and then the private sectors are now starting some private insurance to cover all those things. So this is the government insurance in the first floor, but also the second floor will be covered by private insurances to supply more individual, more advanced service. So by that way, we can keep the uh, fiscal burden for this nursery care to a certain level while we keep this certain service for uh, nursery care so that everybody will be somehow satisfied with nursery care so that we can keep the nursery care, then we can keep all these other uh, national assets, such as the <coughs> national coverage of the healthcare. So these are the one model of the solution advanced countries. No other countries in Asia is not still facing this problem, but already I have, I've heard that China shows keen interest on this nursery care systems, and those people who already invented this the second floor insurance are invited to China almost every three to two, three months to give a speech for what they're doing. So they're already interested in foreseeing the near future. So that's why to achieve this uh, sad allo uh, uh, growth strategy is not only we are growing again, we are revitalized again, but also setting the, some model for mature Asia societies. So I stop here and welcome the question. Thank you very much. We're just going to move the furniture. Um, but as we're doing so, and, and Robert joins us, and also uh, Horisan, uh, let me, I think I need to put to you at this stage, if I may, um, 
what everyone is wo worried about, concerned about, um, but also might be impressed by. What we heard in Dalian last week, and what is then mentioned again on the front page of the Herald Tribune, and I'm sure Robert will press this as well. Um, Japan's on a roll, but could the new tax actually demolish the pace of recovery and therefore um, lead to what one commentator from uh, Mitsubishi Kataoka-san today says, threatening to snuff out the new strength in the Japanese economy, because this underpins the way the region and the world will see the Japanese economy. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, the consumption tax, uh, according to the, that legislation, is scheduled to raise uh, from five to eight next uh, April. And the Prime Minister will be uh, deciding on that uh, finally uh, very soon, the beginning of next month. So uh, it seems to me that uh, every figures we see, the GDPs for uh, April, June, and revised figure for that, and investment and all those figures seems to be, you know, uh, the not the lead signals, not the yellow signals. I, I think it's the blue signals for that. So I, I think this is not whether we are delays for the economies. For economies, it's always better not to do. But this is the question when to do that because of, like what I said, we have to keep all the social welfare service and also fiscal consolidation. So we have to choose the best timing, sooner the better, when is the less burden to the economies. So that's why I think, number one, we have to do this. And also, uh, in these figures, we will see the least uh, burden to the economies. And actually, can I talk about the political cost? The, the, we decided this. Already, legislation is passed. So that's why if we uh, to decide otherwise, then we have to redo or amend that legislation, and that will require many political costs. We have to take so many days and so many manpower, not manpower, but political costs in this coming uh, extraordinary session when we are trying to introduce so many other pieces. All right. So, that's, well, that's what I say. We'll, we'll pick up on those issues. These are obviously technical, uh, internal Japanese issues uh, uh, and very important for the future of the economy if Japan is on a roll for so many reasons. Robert, just before I, I come to you and also to Horisan, can I just, Minister, there are a lot of questions here which are very technical about uh, the economic policy, but there's one particularly, given that you're Minister for Agriculture from Greg's story, Japan worrying about free trade for agriculture, but Japan has the highest quality fruit and vegetables in the world, so Japan can do well in exporting agricultural products. Japan should not see the TPP as a zero-sum game. A quick response on that, given that this is your portfolio at the moment, before we go to Robert and uh, Yoshi. Yeah, thank you for saying that. Uh, I, I believe in that. Uh, we already uh, uh, made up the uh, strategic plan to double our export from uh, 40, uh, 450 billion yen now to uh, 1 trillion yen in seven, eight years. So uh, this is the strength. But actually, uh, on, on, uh, at the end of the day, the TPP is not changing anything for this export. Actually, all those tariff for all those agriculture projects within the TPP is already removed. So that's why that doesn't help uh, Japanese food industry and agriculture industry to export more. So rather than TPP, we have to concentrate on more like SPS, quarantine, and other things to, uh, to boost, the, boost the export of those things. Thank you, Minister. There are also several guests, as uh, Yoshi mentioned, from, from China, from uh, South Korea, uh, from Kenya, uh, and also from Singapore, and, I'd like, and others as well. I'd like to hear your view uh, of what is happening here uh, and the, the rate of change in Japan on the economic front and the impact on, on your countries and your region as well. But uh, Robert, let me come to you. Robert Feldman, Managing Director, Chief Economist, uh, Head of Fixed Income Research uh, at uh, Morgan Stanley here in Tokyo. Okay, thanks very much, and thank you, Mr. Minister, for the uh, excellent uh, summary there. Um, 
I think I'd like to start my remarks with uh, the theme, which is uh, so Japan uh, and the world. Um, one very important thing uh, to echo what uh, the minister has just said uh, is this notion that Japan can show models, we hope positive models, uh, for what's happening elsewhere. And I think a couple are hidden. Uh, or at least not very well understood uh, in what's just happened in the last year. Um, so for example, what has the process of Abenomics been like? Okay. Uh, the first big uh, decision that had to be made, or not, maybe not the first, but one very big decision, was how to choose the central bank governor. Okay. Heretofore, the choice of the central bank governor was essentially an insider's choice. The Ministry of Finance, the BOJ would get together, decide who they wanted, tell the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister would say, okay, and it would go to the Diet, the Diet would say, okay, and that would be the end of it. Okay, that changed. This time, Prime Minister Abe wanted a central bank governor who fulfilled certain criteria. Agreed with him on monetary policy, spoke English well enough to talk globally with his counterparts, knows a lot of macroeconomics, uh, has an aggressive stance on taking action, a, a number of uh, criteria. Other people also added to the criteria. Uh, Finance Minister also added the idea that this is the person should have experience in managing a large organization. So they came up with a list of criteria. So instead of talking about who it should be, they, talk about, they began to talk about what do we want. And once that list of elements of what do we want was clear, it was pretty clear who was gonna get the job. So finally, we had a choice of central bank governor based on the criteria needed rather than on who's friends with whom. This is a major change of the way government operates. Now we understand uh, that uh, the government wants to introduce a system to push this method of choice further down in the bureaucracy. I believe there's a bill uh, bubbling along right now to allow the prime minister's office to choose um, the uh, bureaucrats that will serve in senior positions in every bureaucracy. There's some opposition to this. Why don't we just have ministers who can tell people what to do? Well, the sad fact of the thing is until this administration, a lot of the ministers have been, shall we say, temporary employees, okay, or Hakan Shain, okay? <laughs> they kind of go and they kind of go out and nobody's gonna listen to them, okay? So this is gonna change. So this is an important change of process in the way government works and it will improve the responsiveness of government to uh, the uh, political will. I think this is an unseen aspect of the new administration that's very, very important. There's another one that's very important. As I look at the way policy has been made over the last, uh, say, year, it seems to me that this government uh, is practicing uh, the methods used in that very famous book, I'm sure everybody in a business school has read this, uh, the book Getting to Yes. Okay. Yeah, the Fisher and Yuri book. Okay. I'm, sh I'm sure you studied that at the Kennedy School. You probably studied with Fisher himself, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting book. Okay. First of all, separate the people from the problem. Appointing the central bank governor is not about who, it's about what we're supposed to be doing. Okay. Separate the people from the problem. Okay. Uh, invent alternatives for mutual gain. That's happening in the tax debate right now. Don't negotiate a, about positions, negotiate about interests. Okay. Let's think about this consumption tax debate for a minute. Okay. It started out even as late as three months ago. Do it, don't do it, do it, don't do it. And it was turning into a kind of a theological debate, very bad. Okay. Then the Prime Minister came out and said, look, we have to end deflation. We have to fix this fiscal problem. We have to do a lot of things at the same time. So let's come up with some kind of alternatives that gets us closest to doing what we need to do in all of those areas. So that's where the idea for this offsetting package came. Bunch of ideas, the 1%, 1%, 1%. That idea came up. I think it's a pretty good idea, but my side is losing on that one. Okay. Instead, the idea is, okay, we're going to have a different package of measures. And now, and this is a very difficult debate, if we're going to have a six trillion yen hike of the consumption tax and a five trillion yen offset of some other way, uh, for other measures, will that offset be in tax cuts or in spending? Okay. What is the philosophy of the LDP? Is it a big government party, more taxes, more spending? Or is it a small government party, 
Yes, we have to hike the tax to pay to lower the deficits, but we want to lower taxes elsewhere to encourage innovation in the economy. So that's where the debate is today. But I think it's enormously encouraging that we finally have a government here, maybe the only one around, that's following what Fisher and Yuri proposed in that getting to yes. Okay? So Abe has basically organized a government and orchestrated a set of um, procedures that will help us get to yes. I think the other element uh, that he's used very effectively is, uh, dare I say, ventriloquism. <laughs> he wants to go in a certain direction. He organizes a debate. We hear all kinds of different ideas, and those ideas come up, and gee whiz, the debate just kind of turns out the way he wanted it to. Very clever. Okay? So those are the things I think people are not seeing about this, uh, this um, uh, uh, government. I think there's a lot more to say about uh, Japan and the world in terms of the, uh, the three arrows, uh, but the one I think I want to focus on, if I may, uh, is really the fiscal side. Uh, the uh, cabinet office published a piece on August 8th with their estimate that the fiscal deficit in 2012, final numbers aren't available yet, the estimate for 2012 fiscal year deficit was 53 trillion yen. Okay? In this consumption tax debate, we're arguing about whether we should hike by 10 trillion yen over in, in two stages. Okay? Well, if the deficit is 53 and we're about to hike the tax by 10, what do we do about the other 43? This is something that's getting to be interesting because finally, 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 the debate about fiscal policy is beginning to involve arithmetic. <laughs> arithmetic is very important. And you'd be stunned at the number of people who don't know the basic numbers. How much does, does Japan spend on defense? About four and a half trillion yen, correct? How much do, does Japan spend on pensions? 60 trillion. How much does Japan spend on medical spending? National medical, this is almost 40 trillion yen. How much do we spend on nursing care? A bit over 10 trillion. How much do we spend on family support? A bit over 10 trillion yen. So as I look at the fiscal accounts, the number is not 109. Uh, as Seika Sensei says, that's high enough. Uh, or 113, as Hataki san it's 125. Okay. If we're spending 125 on social spending and four and a half on defense, can we really have peace in Asia? This is a difficult question. Okay. So the point I want to make here is that the fiscal issue is not just an issue about social services and growth. It's also an issue about the geopolitical peace in the region. So let me leave my remarks there. Thanks, Robert. An issue of geopolitical peace in the region. Uh, can I just point out that very first point that you made, Robert, about uh, trust in, in business and government? Of course, we're going to be addressing that at 4 o'clock uh, because Richard Edelman is here with his trust barometer. So that's something we're going to move into, uh, which is significant, particularly because of, uh, of what the barometer is saying and what the research is saying. So let's park that one for the moment, if we can, because we're doing an hour and a half on that uh, at 4 o'clock. But, Minister, can I just, before we go to, to Yoshi, uh, there are a couple of very important points. Um, can we really have peace in Asia? And that question, what do we do about the other 43? In other words, the problem of the arithmetic. Do you want to answer that quickly? <laughs> yeah, uh, we've been keeping peace in Asia with this uh, small amount of budget, the thanks to the US-Japan alliance. Uh, but uh, the, the defense white paper is saying that the things are changing, the, the, the uh, security environment is changing, uh, mainly the potential threat from uh, China and also a threat from North Korea is dramatically changing. So that's why uh, if fiscal, uh, you know, the situation allows, I think it's very quite natural to uh, increase steadily for the defense budget. Um, and the, what was the second question? The, 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 the About the 43. Oh, 43. Yeah. yeah, what's happened to the other four? Actually, arithmetic teaches us only three things. Raise tax rate, raise economies, cut spending. So the mixture of those three things 
can only answer to those arithmetic. So that's why, like he said, a two or twelve, a two or fifteen is the target for half the half the figures, and then the, we will be achieving two or twenty the uh, primary balance. Uh, so that's why, after two or fifteen, we have to think about these three things more hard. And I need to put to you that amazing new economic concept of economic ventriloqu ventriloquism. Um, is, that, is that a new Japanese policy principle? No, it's not new and it's not Japanese. <laughs> Politicians around the world have used it for years. It's called public opinion. <laughs> <laughs> But do you think the Japanese are doing it well at the moment? I think, yeah, it's the... Uh, but I need to ask the minister yeah. whether he, he feels that that's yeah, happening as well. Uh, Fukuajutsu. Economy Fukuajutsu means the... For example, at the uh, Council of Economic and Fiscal Policy, yeah. back in the Koizumi days, when Koizumi wanted to do something, yeah. he would have the private sector members make a proposal. Oh, 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 and then all the ministers were against it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then Koizumi said, okay, do it. Okay. <laughs> so this is ventriloquism. Ah. That's in Japanese we we call kabuki, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and that's a Japanese traditional uh, way. Uh, so that the playing good kabuki uh, receives so many uh, appreciation, but if you play badly, then you will be hit. <laughs> so you you should be very careful about that, I think. Okay, good. Uh, just before I come to, uh, just one moment, Robert, I'd like to put on notice um, um, uh, Vachora Panchat from Thailand and also Ted Tan from Singapore and Jiren Liu and Chung In Moon to get those views from the region as well if you'd like to contribute just after we've heard uh, from Robert and Horisan again. Robert, you wanted to come back quickly. Yes, if I may, two things, uh, two things on uh, the regional stuff and or one on the regional, one on the e economy. Um, first of all, we've got to make very, very clear uh, on the regional economic ties and uh, security ties. Japan and China are natural partners. There is no reason to think there's any kind of inevitable conflict. Quite the contrary. China has every interest in improving living standards of its own population, and the government has every interest in doing that, if only for its own survival. Japan has every interest in maintaining peace in the region as well. So these two countries are natural partners, even from a geopolitical point of view. From an economic point of view, even more so. Japan has a lot of capital, a lot of technology, not enough people. China has a lot of people, some technology, and it's very poor. It's still very poor. These countries are economically natural partners. Okay? So the whole point of, of economic policy, I think, for the two countries put together, even in a bilateral relationship, and I'm not a big believer in bilateral relationships anymore, but even in a bilateral relationship, these two countries are natural partners. And so the whole economic and geopolitical structure has to be considered in that context. There are forces in both countries that want to see things go well. There are other forces that have, shall we say, um, private uh, parochial interests in seeing things not go well to increase budgets, et cetera. Uh, but what we have to do is make sure that, uh, shall we say, the good guys on both sides are in communication with each other enough to suppress the forces that might push things in the wrong direction. So I think it's very important to remember that this is not an adversarial relationship. It is a relationship where people with common interests on both sides need to work together to bring a positive outcome. Yoshi, your view of the discussion so far and also where Japan is and the changes you've seen in Japan's relationship with the region and further afield. Okay, um, well, uh, being Japanese for 51 years, I've seen the upturn um, until 1990 for 28 years. Japan is surging, Japan is, was number one. And after 1990, for 22 years, we've seen downside, like a downslope of Japanese economy and then presence in terms of international economy as well as politics. And now we feel that there's a curve is coming up again for the first time. And that is uh, the sentiment of most of the Japanese people. And that has been highlighted by the Tokyo 2020 and also by Abenomics and also the surge of, uh, 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 in terms of uh, uh, political strength and foreign affairs strength that has been done by Prime Minister Abe. From, from a private sector view, there has been six diseases that all the corporate CEOs had been suffering 
you know, it's, it's about you know, energy, it's about you know, currency, it's about um, CO2, and it's about corporate tax, and also labor, and so forth. And out of six diseases, within, let's say, 10 months up until now, Abe has tackled three uh, things. One is about uh, TPP, because uh, in case of the, if you compare with Korea and Japan, Japanese exporters had to have more uh, duties when they export to uh, the U.S. or Europe. And that will be, most likely, in, in terms of the U.S., will be equalized. That's a big thing for Japanese exporters. And also about, let's say, about the um, currency. We had a especially high Japanese yen currency, but now it's been equalized a little bit. And then it's not yet back to what it was before uh, 2008, which before Lima shock, but the yen has become weakened, which is because uh, it has become much better for Japanese exporters. In terms of CO2 emission, uh, Kyoto Protocol we had had uh, with uh, uh, Minister Kawaguchi, who will be presenting at the uh, breakup session. But it was a good thing for the world, but it was a bad thing for Japan, Japanese exporters and companies, simply because we had to have more burden in terms of CO2 emission. But on the other hand, we had th still three uh, diseases. Uh, one is uh, a corporate, high corporate income tax, which is now debated by the politics, and we are hoping that the corporate income tax will be lowered. And then two other is about labor law, and, the, and then at the same time, this is also being discussed. They're being discussed by uh, uh, the po politicians. And uh, um, so, if you and, and at the same time, energy, it is most likely that the uh, you know, we have an energy session as well in the breakup session, but this is most likely that the government has a strong interest to restart uh, the uh, nuclear power plants. And so if you think about six diseases, Abe is a very uh, full business, pro-business. This is so much different from the other uh, uh, DO, uh, B, uh, uh, Democratic Party of Japan, DPJ. And the pro-business, therefore, see, uh, most of the CEOs are so welcoming about Abe's uh, attitude and also policy which is a good sign. Therefore, we see that there's an upside until 1990 and now down, and then we are seeing some strength, strong hope. And in terms of consumption tax as well, we feel that because of Tokyo Olympic 2020, we feel that there's a good reasons why we have to do something about fiscal confederation and as well as about you know, the public spending. And uh, at the same time, there will be a booster in terms of uh, Tokyo uh, economy. So I think it's a good sign. Good things are going on. So thanks to Hayasan and all the cabinets, we feel the Japanese people are supporting the Abe administration by more than 70%, which is so different. All right. Well, let's get some other views. Uh, Jiren Liu, where are you? I can't see. You have a microphone here, please. Uh, who is chairman? Do you have a microphone, please? Uh, and a second microphone as well uh, to uh, Bachara Panchet, who's down in the front row. Uh, your chairman and chief executive of uh, Newsoft. So, what is crazy? Well, how you see Japan? Okay. Japan being on a roll, and particularly what we've just heard uh, from Robert. Uh, China and Japan, economically natural partners. Okay. But a, a sense that something is turning, uh, quite apart from all the political challenges okay. between the two countries. So, so my name is Liu Jiren. I'm from China. Uh, I'm a founder of New South Group. So I think uh, all the points, I fully agree with uh, Robert's point about the relationship with China with Japan. So uh, you know, I started to cover with a Japanese uh, company in, uh, from 1988. So that means already uh, 23 years. And we're growing an uh, average more than 20% every year in that business. Even during that period, a lot of uh, issues uh, just like today. So I think uh, today for me is not the uh, first time, many of time about that. So uh, I think the two countries, uh, I don't know what time we can solve the problem about uh, you know, political issues, even uh, territory issues, island issues. But I can say the economic cooperation between the business sector is uh, still growing well. And also we build a trust. We uh, rely on each other. And also the both of the country is, uh, if we really can be uh, together, I think it's a contribution is not only to the Asia areas, also uh, to drive the growth of uh, uh, world economy. And your perception about Abenomics and the impact it's having on the Japanese economy in the last four or five months? Uh, I, I, say, uh, I can say the good trends. I, I don't think, uh, you know, 
I, as a Chinese, I think the uh, economy of Japan is growing is very good for China. Uh, because if you look at the past many years, and when the Japan economy get down, I think uh, China also suffer some uh, kind of impact. So I'm happy to say that uh, you know, the new uh, government uh, can drive and the uh, economy of Japan is have a very positive uh, changing. Uh, I don't know what is uh, the future that really uh, influence about uh, for sustainable growth, but I think uh, changing is very important. And Japan keep many years never change. So that kind of signal is not so good. Uh, but if you look at changing, even a little bit, uh, you know, the challenge, I think it's a good signal to the world and also a good signal to China. Great, thank you. And please keep your messages coming if you'd like to uh, add a, a comment or two, which I can then bring into the discussion. Thanks very much. Have you got a microphone there? Yeah. Um, Vachara Panchet, and of course, you're Chairman uh, Emeritus of the Pacific Basin Economic Council. What are you seeing uh, in the last few months on Japan? Yes. Uh, first of all, congratulations for the Olympics. That is like a fourth <laughs> arrow of Abe in Japan. So uh, that is great. Um, I, I, I think, first of all, let me speak on the term of uh, being a partner with Japanese company, namely Mitsubishi Motors, for the past 30 years with my family. This is a welcome, a breath of fresh air, and really we see uh, it as a... Not, I, in my life, I haven't seen this thing in Japan yet. Uh, well, I'm a little bit close to uh, Horizon but in, in age, but uh, of course, uh, this is very, very new, and it's a positive change. Um, when I serve as a Thailand trade representative, which is equivalent to USD, USDI in the States. Uh, I was here in my official visit three times, trying to get a JR company to try to invest in infrastructure in Thailand for we have the, uh, the rail system. Uh, competitors will be, of course, naturally from China and so on. It took a year for them to move on agenda. And of course, uh, it was too slow to make decision. Now, with this government, I see a lot of change. And I had my uh, the first two arrows. Now the third arrow would be, of course, involving uh, regions like ASEAN, like uh, India, China, and so on. That uh, I hope it uh, will last long. I know it's going to work very well. But uh, my my point would be, it work if it work long enough, then the sustainability will kicks in, and we see a lot of change together. We would like Japan to head into this thing in the long term and. Uh, the, the bonus and the ability to make change and make decision. Sometimes decision can be wrong, can be right, but it's better, not by, better than not making it all. So my point would be, your com that is a compliment and, and you know, my, my request to you. Given, uh, given the Japanese investment interest, and particularly after the, the, the big floods and so on, and the impact on, on production there, are you feeling a significant Japanese economic robustness returning in its relationship with Thailand? Well, I think uh, when, when you start to do any cooperation, you start with the policy first. So that when the government, G2G, and the government uh, start first, it's, it's quite effective. Then the business uh, people can carry on. So with, with that help, we see a lot of cooperation and a, a lot of uh, quick decisions ha happen. Sometimes there's a lot of people say about NATO, no action, talk only. So sometimes you, you just talk a lot and, and you, you just cannot deliver it. This is something which I see the difference. So I hope that you continue the good work and then uh, we are here. Actually, uh, it, this coming, I'm sure you're gonna be there too, the uh, APEC meeting in October in Bali. So there'll be a, a topic about the, the cooperation among the Asia Pacific countries. As well. But do you think the Japanese growth is now sustainable to you? I, I look at it that way now because Good. of the, uh, the motive from the Good. government. Okay, Ted Tan from Singapore, Deputy Chief Executive of Spring, which is part of the uh, Ministry of Trade and Industry. Ted. Thanks, Nick. Uh, thanks, Nick. And uh, thanks to the Minister and the panelists for very insightful uh, comments. Um, I just want to make a comment regarding the uh, recent report. According to a public poll that was conducted by Nihon Keizai Shimbun Shah and TV Tokyo in May, 68% of the respondents supported the second uh, RB cabinet and 62% were satisfied with economic policy. And uh, further, the International Institute for Management Development, a well-known business school in Luzon, Switzerland, has raised Japan's ranking of international competitiveness by three places as a result of the RB's uh, expansionary measures. So, suggesting economics is working successfully. So, congratulations. In Singapore, we are very excited by the uh, Japanese um, companies which are looking to expand into ASEAN countries. We've seen many of them who are looking for collaboration and partnership with Singapore companies because of the ability and also the experience that they have in expanding 
and also doing business in Asian countries. So my comment is that, well, maybe being a bit provocative, provocative now the Japanese economy seems to be on the roll, as uh, Nick, you mentioned this morning. Uh, my question would be, will the economy boom under the Arbinomics and as a short-lived bubble, or will it be sustainable? I know uh, Dr. Panchek mentioned that it's sustainable, so I guess my question is, um, I think it's on the roll, but uh, the question will it be sustainable. So Thank you. you in Singapore are just a little anxious that it may not be sustainable. We are very excited about the uh, successful um, economics, but whether it's sustainable, that's a question that I personally have. Because yeah. one of the great indicators in Singapore, of course, is traffic through the container port. Yeah. Uh, are you, how is that moving? How has it been moving in the last three or four months? And does that indicate a uh, kind of knock on a multiplier effect from Japan? Well, it's, uh, it's still moving very well. Um, so I think the logist I'm actually leading also a logistics uh, mission to Japan this trip to foster more collaboration with the logistics company between Singapore and Japan. So I'm seeing uh, more p possible collaboration with Japan. Thank you. Excellent. Is Professor Moon here? I can't immediately see you. Okay. Is Professor Moon here? I can't immediately see him. No, from Korea. Okay. Robert. There's been some uh, discussion about uh, uh, whether uh, Abenomics would succeed or not. When I ask uh, my clients, mostly here in Japan, uh, what do you think of the probability that Abenomics will succeed? And I define success as uh, getting the real growth rate to two, nominal growth rate to three and a half, and stabilizing, not necessarily reducing, but stabilizing the ratio of debt to GDP. Okay, that's the definition. So what client do you think is the probability that Abenomics will succeed? There are two groups. One group says 50%, the other group says 20. Okay, it sounds like they're optimists and pessimists. Actually, they're hyper-optimists and modest optimists. Okay, 20% is actually an optimistic number. Okay, why do I say that? Okay, well a year ago it was zero. So that's an improvement. The other point is that if there are really three stages of whether we can get to all of those goals. First is, do we get the growth? Okay. If you're an optimist on growth, you'd say we have a 60-40 chance of actually implementing those growth targets, the 3.5% nominal, 2% uh, uh, real. 60-40. Okay. Okay. Uh, secondly, the August 8th report by the cabinet office. They have a certain uh, goal for the fiscal deficit. They believe or they project uh, that the fiscal deficit in 2020 will come down to about 5.5% of GDP, the overall deficit. Okay? That's about 35 trillion. They say in that report it's not enough. It's not enough to stabilize the ratio of debt to GDP. Therefore, more will have to be done. Okay, so there are two stages of fiscal. First, do what the cabinet office is implying. They'll give you a deficit, but they won't give you revenue and, and spending lines. A little bit strange, but anyway. And then there's a second stage. Okay? So say the first stage of, of the fiscal reforms is successful, 60-40%. Say there's a, a percentage on the second stage, 60-40%. Okay? So here's 60-40 on growth, 60-40 on the first stage of fiscal, 60-40 on the second stage of fiscal. 60-40 is pretty optimistic, okay? But if you sort of do the overall calculation, you end up with 0.6 times 0.6 times 0.6, so about 20%, okay? So at this point, 20% chance of success seems to me like it's a little bit high, hmm. okay? Which is why there's so much left to do and why we have to talk about arithmetic. And we can come back to this a little bit later if, uh, if there's uh, some time. What Minister, say? what is your uh, estimate of the chance of success? 20%, lower, higher? Help us out. Even if you are on the record, we'd love to hear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Because you have a sort of slight skepticism, but a, a feeling that there's a, sorry, a bad yeah. pun on a day like this. <laughs> there's a fair wind behind Japan. <laughs> there's a big wind out there at the oh, moment, yeah, but yeah, economically yeah, there's a fair yeah. wind. Inside is nice, I think. Uh, uh, actually, the, uh, the, the, we, we got a revised figure of uh, April, June uh, GDP, but also I found that the uh, same period, GNI was more than 6% close, 6%. So, you know, the thinking about the trade balance, now we, we are, you know, not operating any nuclear power plant since last a couple of days, so uh, the trade balance is red. But even trade balance is red because of that. The 
GNI means the income balance is really big. Why? Because we invested already and that return from that investment is coming back to Japan. So rather than just watching GDP, if we see the GNI, then it, it, it will be including all those uh, income uh, from the investment. So if, if we see the GNI, I think the, uh, that, that level will be increasing more. But like he said, the fiscal part, the second arrow is not just only boosting, but how to keep the very bit difficult balance between boosting in a short run, but in the mid run and longer run, how to consolidate. So just taking that balance is not only arithmetic uh, answers, because we have to ask for the borders for tax hike and everything. So political things mixed, but uh, it's no one single answers. You have to be a very good doctor about how is the healthy you know, conditions. And if you feel that you need more this side, then you have to put a little bit more on that. But always thinking about that side, that you have to do it here, then you have to pay back in some days in the near future. So that's why I think the uh, very uh, uh, important part of the second arrow is how we can achieve the three things, the tax, tax increase and the economy growth and also uh, the expenditure cut, those three things after 2 or 15, after we achieved the first goal of the uh, primary balance 50%, and towards 2 or 20, we, we have to still think about that, the remaining part of that, like he said, 40 something. So uh, that part is really an important part. So, but Prime Minister is always saying that, uh, you know, if we have a sound economy, then we can have a sound fiscal consolidation plan. And that so, figure of 20%? I think that's fair enough. You know, 60, 60, 60, maybe the, those people who answer the question is not thinking in that way. So if they are asked one single question, then figures might be higher than that. All right. I have to say, uh, well, I have to ask you, first of all, is there a feeling in government now that the, the Olympics decision is a fourth arrow for you? Uh, I think it's a good boost for Abenomic success and also the uh, boost for the sad allows because everybody's sad allows are really supported by the sentiment of the people. So this is trying to create the environment. But finally, that's a private decision in best, higher people. So that's why the sentiment is getting much, much better after we got that. So that, that's why I, I think it's a big boost for the Sadalo. I have to say, when, uh, when I was um, discussing this with Asasan, the finance minister at the ADB in Delhi, in India, back in May, he didn't talk about arrows, he talked about bazookas. <laughs> no comment on that. <laughs> Okay, a couple of technical points. Uh, Greg Storey has raised the point, just picking up on China, Minister, just for you at the moment. Um, in, their, in the past, there have been senior uh, Japanese leaders who could pick up the phone to talk to Chinese leaders. Uh, my impression is that this has now changed and those key relationships are not as well developed. I, is this the case? The, since the uh, uh, former government decision, just the one, almost one year, uh, to quote unquote uh, nationalize or purchase whatever the word is, the island, the situation's getting, I think it was in these two, three decades while I was in this job. So I think uh, it might take, uh, not decades, but years to reach to the next uh, uh, equilibrium like we had before that uh, decision, or even before that uh, shipman's case uh, early in the DPJ government. So uh, two things are required. One thing is setting a hotline between the people to people at the, at the has site. Has that been reestablished or not, the hotline? Uh, the, uh, the hotline is under negotiation, but still not uh, established yet, finally, I think. That, uh, 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 was almost done uh, last, uh, I think, uh, last uh, spring, 
but the final visit from China was cancelled because of Japan hosting the Tibet or something uh, conference in Tokyo. So that was the situation. So we are trying to get it over. And was the five-minute meeting, the, the, the chance meeting in St. Petersburg, would that mm -hmm. have helped a little? Yes, it's the sign of uh, uh, better than, you know, we not seeing each other, but it always, when we start, it's just starting with those tachibanashi, and then the meeting, and then the things going on. So I think it's going on the track, but uh, what I would like to say is, you know, this is the second category of the political level that ministers and prime ministers, but this is a site, that hotline between the people on the site, so that uh, to avoid the things that, the, the, you know, mishappens. So, but to, after keeping this, it might, what I'm saying is that this side, to reach to the next political equilibrium uh, might take more times than just establish the side-to-side right. -side things. Your, your thoughts, all three of you on TPP and, and those issues have stimulated some thoughts from the audience. Can we get the microphone to Melanie Brock and also to, to Richard Edelman with questions about TPP? Melanie, where are you? Please, at the back, and then to Richard as well. The microphone to, to Melanie, right up there, please, and also to Richard, who's three uh, rows in front. Sorry, I just wanted to ask the minister at this point uh, whether you had any comments about the, the timing of the TPP, but more importantly, perhaps, from those who live in, for those who live in Japan and, indeed, the Japanese agricultural um, sort of uh, a sector, what's the true pace of reforms that we can expect as part of this shift that we're seeing in Japan? And you also make a point about gender. Uh, yes, but I didn't want to sound too bossy. But uh, I'm very keen to hear what your views are as a panel about the comments made by Abe recently about the importance of the government focusing on greater participation by women in the workforce. And uh, I'd love to see a woman up on the panel one day. Thank you. I warned Yoshi about this. This is a really serious issue at every conference about, uh, about women on panels. Um, Richard Edelman on TPP. Mr. Minister, do you see any sort of uh, trade-off between the progress on TPP and the Americans looking towards the Atlantic to make a transatlantic deal, you know, to get TPP done, in a sense, before something happens with Europe simultaneously? So uh, it's in people's minds here, Minister, uh, TPP, about yeah. the way it's going. Please. Uh, the, we are also in the TPP, but also we are in the negotiation started with EU, and also ASEAN plus six started. So United States is positioning themselves in between TPP and transatlantic things, but also we are in the uh, TPP, ASEAN plus six, ASEAN plus EU. So everybody, everybody is trying to be the center of the liabilities. So that's nice. So uh, for us, the, uh, it's giving some uh, uh, maybe bargaining tips. But uh, uh, I think the reform of the Japanese ag agriculture and the TPP are uh, not 100% related. This is not a necessary condition to get into the TPP to reform the uh, Japanese agriculture. And we cannot wait to see the result of the TPP to start the Japanese reform for the agriculture. So that's why we are already starting about the reform program of the Japanese ag ag agriculture, which is already set in the uh, cycle program, which is the growth plan, which already decided at the cabinet level in June, and in which we said already that in this coming uh, 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 extraordinary session starting October, we are trying to uh, 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 introduce the legislation to accelerate the land accumulation to more energetic, younger farmers, rather than just average age of the Japanese farmers is already 66 years old. So I think this is the chance at the same time, so that they will be eventually dialing, so that uh, gathering by leasing all those farmland from those retiring farmers to younger energetic ones, um, average acreage of two hectares should be enhanced to, to five, to 10, to 15, so that productivity will be increasing, so that they would be more uh, stronger. 
and then we can expect younger generations coming into farming because they will see the future for that. So that is even before we are finalizing TPP, we have to do, and we already started that process. Robert, do you, do you accept, do you, do, are you that optimistic on, on TPP? Do you, do you think the realities are? Oh, 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 sorry, I didn't say I'm for optimistic about TPP finalization, but we are in the negotiation already. So what we are trying to do is to, to, to uh, keep our interest in utmost manners. This is the negotiations. So every year as we've been, or, or all the participating members before we enter has been saying that uh, TPP should be finalized next year. 2010, they says by 2011. And then 2011, they say by 2012. And 2012, they say by next year. Now we are in the next year. So what we can do is to, you know, uh, in October, APEC uh, leadership meeting, how, why don't we do that in a framework agreement and then we should focus on more difficult part after that. So that's the plan, but still we are facing the very difficult part remained. So that's why we are trying our utmost effort, but this is not the uh, big guarantee we have. But Richard Edelman's point about what will Japan be prepared to give up, um, possibly as part of a TPP? Uh, we are not ready to give up anything, so that the, that should be decided by the negotiations. Yeah, I'm actually optimistic on the TPP for, uh, first of all, uh, uh, a reason of public opinion. Uh, when Prime Minister Abe decided we are going to enter the TPP negotiations, his support rate went up. That's very important, because in order to maintain this government in power, it's very important for the support rate to stay high. He's essentially practicing what Machiavelli said about uh, the two ways that you can remain in power. Either you can uh, play to the aristocrats and hope you can manipulate them and, and stay in power, or you can go over the head of the aristocrats and play to the people. Machiavelli's advice is play to the people, because none of the aristocrats want you to stay in power. <laughs> okay? So what he did, by going to the people and saying, look, it is in our national interest, to do TPP, it worked. So that's the first reason I'm very, very optimistic. The second reason is when he went to Washington, he sort of exposed the position of the United States uh, as, um, well, normally hypocritical. All trade negotiations are exercises in hypocrisy because everybody wants something and doesn't want to give up anything. Okay? So when uh, Prime Minister Abe went to Washington, he could say, yeah, we want to be in TPP and we have this and that. But by the way, you're talking about all these things with no tariffs. Now, <clears throat> tell me, what about autos? Are you going to give up your auto tariffs? What about sugar? Are you going to give up your sugar tariffs? And of course, Obama could never agree to that. And so what that did is it created a atmosphere say, okay, this is a negotiation and we can talk behind closed doors and come up with a deal that we can all live with even if it's not perfect. Whether this is good or bad for free trade is, is not so clear because vested interests in the United States, just as in Japan, do have a tendency to hijack this process. And so when that agreement does finally come out from behind the closed doors it's behind, we have to examine very carefully whether the vested interests in all countries have hijacked the thing. This is very important for us and, and the population to look at. But at this point, uh, the notion that free trade is good for your political career uh, in Japan actually has taken on new legs, and so that's why I'm, I'm positive. Okay. Uh, in terms of TPP and about, about uh, Prime Minister Abe, I would point two things. One is that Abe has shown strong leadership. In terms of rock bedded resistances or regulations, in terms of TPP, you know, it was so difficult decision to come in, but Abe has shown strong leadership because of the support from the people, and therefore he was able to push in, and therefore he is able to tackle all those like a uh, hard uh, rock you know, uh, resistances in terms of the, the deregulation, and that will happen. Second is that he is very good in terms of communication to the public. He uses Facebook. I think he is the most followed uh, 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 user of Facebook uh, in Japan. How many followers? How many likes? Well, I Any think idea? About, followers about something like uh, over uh, 50, I'm not sure, I don't have a figure about more about, more about 500 million, I mean 500,000 
maybe close to one million. But I have to check. Somebody can check it on Facebook. Maybe you could. Someone on yeah, Facebook but, at the know, moment. He uses you know, not only the numbers, but he uses it very, very effectively. So uh, whatever he cannot com uh, communicate through the media, he uses Facebook with a picture on. And it's been liked you know, so many uh, instantly, and so many comments are being made. So with that, you know, uh, with that, he has been quite good in terms of going into the area that has shown strong interest or strong resistance by the, some interested parties. However, he was able to communicate directly to, uh, to the people with a strong support. He was able to get the uh, support rate going up with TPP. And then he, he has to go through that process for a restart of nuclear energy. Uh, but he will use that kind of techniques in terms of communicating to the public as well and come up with some agenda and uh, he will be very smooth in terms of doing it. But uh, again, he has to do it for the corporate income tax the dec decrease as well as the labor market um, free uh, liberalization as well. But I think he will be able to do that. All know, right, we've got 15 minutes to run. Robert, let me just pick up on one point which the minister mentioned. We have now have red numbers because of the decisions on nuclear uh, reactors and the last one's just been closed. How much could that be a real anchor on this, uh, on this role? Uh, in the sense of uh, the... Well, financially and economically. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, because because yeah. the minister just said it's now red, you know, it's creating yeah. red numbers. Yeah. The, um, the trade numbers, yeah. The, the cost of uh, shutting down all the nukes has been about 3 trillion yen in terms of the, uh, the trade balance. That is, if you value oil at 100 bucks a barrel, okay, uh, and then look at the amount of electricity uh, that is lost, substitute fossil fuels for the amount lost from the nukes, the net cost is about 3 trillion. Okay. That is part of the reason that the trade balance has gone into the red. Not the whole reason, but part of the reason. Okay. Um, the overall trade balance right now, I think, is in the red about six uh, plus trillion, something on, on that order. So it's not just the nukes that have, uh, the close down of the nukes that have done this. There have been a lot of factories that have shifted abroad. And so one of the reasons uh, to correct this excessive overvaluation at the end is to reverse some of that, uh, some of that flow. Now, it's not clear we can get the factories back but at least we can stop the outflow and maybe get some new, new factories and new areas built, built domestically. Um, even if all the nukes restarted tomorrow, okay, say they're all declared safe or they all are safe, they all started tomorrow, that would not solve the trade deficit problem because it's a little bit deeper than, than uh, just, just the energy. Could this issues. be a real drag, in your view, mm -hmm. on the economic change? I think it is. Yeah, I think yeah. it is. Uh, but uh, that said, um, there are countries that have had uh, very large trade, uh, trade deficits for a long time and have still done very well, the United States being one of them, of course. So uh, the concept that uh, Minister uh, Hayashi has brought up about the gross national income is very important. As long as we invest the money wisely in high return projects, then we're going to be okay. But if we keep uh, pumping the money into, uh, say, social programs that have very little impact on the future of the economy, then we're in real, real trouble. I mean, one of the issues I think that uh, the trade balance raises uh, is uh, this issue of, okay, if we keep having these trade balances, who's going to buy the bonds? Okay. Well, people will continue to buy the bonds if they see a future for the country. Okay? But there is no future for the country if we keep spending immense amounts on the elderly and not enough on the young. Who is going to pay the pensions if we don't invest more in our young people? A lot more thoughts coming through. Uh, Tuk Seng, uh, could I get the microphone to Thierry Port, please? Where are you, Thierry? Over there. Because there are two questions and issues raised about arrows here. Tuk Seng Lo, uh, you'll be speaking in the economics panel. If the present administration could add two more arrows, what might these be, Minister? And Thierry, you've got another point as well. Yes, so uh, I just want to, before I get into my point, one quick thing on TPP that isn't discussed very much in Japan, and that is that if it, is, if it does go forward, it has to be passed by the United States Congress. And from conversations that I have in the United States, it does not look good as, it, as we speak right now. And the uh, enormous irony is that all this effort will be made in Japan to move forward on TT, TPP, and the U.S. Congress won't pass it, then we have a real problem on our hands. But the question that I put in, in comment uh, is, uh, for the third arrow, we are talking about reform. And I, I am also optimistic. Uh, but I, you know, there's the optimism that is based on, I want to be optimistic because the alternative is just too horrible to consider. And then there is the, I want to be optimistic because I see the reality uh, moving forward. And, and the question I have for the panel is, for this reform, uh, if we're going to have the third arrow, we have to have reform. 
Reform means change. It means sacrifice. It means vested interests have to be uh, willing or have to be forced uh, to lose those interests. It also means, in a very general way, there has to be creative destruction. Some of the old vested interests have to disappear or step down. New things come in their place. Do we have enough of this? Are we moving at the right pace in order for the third arrow to get to the target? And that other question as well. Two more Sorry. arrows. What might they be? Minister. Yes. Uh, Fast things on the uh, American Congress, I think, uh, as I understand, the, they need to pass the trade promotion authorize, uh, authorizations, like fast tracks, they used to call. And TPA is not given to the US government yet. So I think it's going to be very tough for them to get that. And then through that TPA process, they're going to pass the TPPs. But I have to stop here because this is on the record. So. <laughs> So the reform, the, like he said, the getting to yes method is really important, I think, because you know, at the end of the day, every consumer is somehow, in a sense, suppliers. So there's not only the consumers, but you know, in, in that time, maybe they could be uh, suppliers. So uh, that's why how to finally get into uh, the yes is really important and like he said we are in the process of doing that so for example the it is used to be said that uh, we have to open up every farm run to be purchased by the corporations but we started with the leasing almost four years ago and so many people coming in by leasing and they started farming in the villages and now they started to realize that be a, be a really stable, sustainable farming process, they have to get together with the farmers surrounding them, to, you know, using irrigation together and all those things. So they are now starting to learn about how to do that. So their request itself is shifting, like people in the Sangyo Kyosur Kaigi and also the Kisei Kaika Kaigi are saying, that boost for more racing. So that's why we started that uh, uh, intermediate uh, uh, you know, organization for uh, accumulating land. So that's why step by step you will be learning and your request at the beginning might be shifting towards more realistic one to boost the result. So that's why in that way we are trying to you know, narrow the way to finally getting to the yes. So that's what we are trying to do and we are already do, doing that way. And just before Robert speaks, could I get the microphone to Glenn Fukushima and also David Liebrach as well? Because you both make very interesting points about immigration. Robert, picking up on what the minister has said. I was actually was, was uh, going to pick up on what Terry said about uh, speed. Uh, and I, I know that I'm the one who brought up the book Getting DS, but unfortunately on the question of whether we're moving fast enough in enough areas, unfortunately my answer is no, no, no. Um, it depends on the area. In agriculture, I think we're doing reasonably well. In energy, I think it's doing reasonably well. I'm not a big nuke fan, but there are a lot of other things happening in energy that are, that are important. I think in government reform, it's OK. Education is a particular area where I think there's progress. But in the labor market things that Tori spoke about, about tax system, I don't think we're doing very well. Immigration hasn't even really begin to move in a, begun to move in a serious way yet. Maybe the taboo's broken, but not much. And in my uh, pet peeve and all of this, to me, probably the most important element of the, f of the third arrow is electoral reform. Because we can't do the other things if we still have a diet and where both houses are heavily skewed in favor of the elderly. Can you imagine two more arrows, Robert, quickly? Um, well, it depends on what you want to define as an arrow. But I would say if you want to separate electoral reform off as a, as a different arrow, that it might you know, get that status. Um, and let's see, what would be the... the uh, well, think about uh, it, extra, and maybe yeah, come back okay. to you at the end. I got one. Got... I got you one. I got you one. So. <laughs> uh, you've got a... How many do you have? How many, how many arrows do you have in a quiver? Is it six? Got me. <laughs> okay. If anyone can go on Wikipedia to check that one out. Um, you just mentioned immigration. Let's go to, to Glenn and also to uh, David, just because you've both made important points about migration and immigration. Uh, so I have a question. I'm Glenn Fukushima. I have a question for Minister Hayashi. Uh, you know, many of the problems Japan <clears throat> faces uh, have to do with the demographics and uh, the low birth rate, the uh, 
the fact that uh, the elderly population is growing and so forth. Um, and so obviously immigration is a major issue that nobody seems to want to confront. So other Asian countries, including Singapore in particular, have very clear immigration policies. So I wanted to know, uh, within Abenomics or even beyond Abenomics, what, what do you see as the Japanese government's immigration policy with regard to both high-skilled and low-skilled uh, workers? And David as well. Uh, where are you? Please, right at the back. David? Uh, David, because you, you have a point about immigration too. Actually, uh, David Liebrich, my point was very similar to Mr. Fukushima. Uh, basically, for both low-skilled as well as for high-skilled individuals, uh, relaxing, reforming immigration, how might that potentially be another arrow in the, in the quiver? Thank you. And we've got a microphone over there. Yeah. Just a little more microphone, please. Keep going. Just stand up and maybe you could just project a little. Your issue in that it's going to, one, prices have increased, uh, energy prices have increased over 15%, and then there will be, should be a significant drag to industrial production as well as just in general capacity, and I think that that can have a particular bad knock-on effect for the economy. But in, in regards to uh, the staggered slow part and the increased uh, during the, I think you said that the, the total value was like three trillion that the loss over the two years, but since June, that number was like 1.7 trillion. And because of the import, the necessity of importation of LNG and additional coal and gas during the winter time, I think that can have a, a serious deleterious effect. And I was wondering if you could expound on that. All right. So immigration, and there's also a point from Shane Baldwin uh, on nuclear plants. There'll be a considerable drag on the economy. Is that comment there? But Minister, particularly these two questions on immigration, skilled workers, the demographic drag, and so on. Thank you, Glenn. Um, <clears throat> actually, the uh, the the uh, active usage of like like. Uh, lady from Australia says that that is one of the main policy to counter that, that the more more f you know women's working in the societies, at the same time, you know they raise the children. Uh, so how to how to make the uh, environment so that they can do two other sports at the same time. So that's the one thing we have to do and. Also, the usage of the elderly people. It's 65 years too young to be retiring now in Japan. So uh, thinking about uh, Hiromi Go is already almost 60 years old. So that's, that's the, not an age of retirement. But uh, saying that, I think uh, the immigration issues has been the, one of the, the difficult issues here, too. We actually, one reason is, I said this is difficult is we failed once. At the height of the bubble economies in 1980s and 90s, we just loosened all those regulations and all those uh, labors came in and what happened afterwards without any social securities and all those things. So, so, so many things happened. So we still have that kind of thing. So that's why that's kind of experience. So the the debate within the party, as I remember, in now I'm here, but uh, before that, that was like how to focus on those people at the uh, more, more, more high-skilled labors fast. So that's why just uh, how about uh, having some kind of Japanese language test to give them a uh, uh, visa or some, something like that. But it's still going on. So it seems like the debate are more focusing on activate more women and elderly, rather than talking about immigration. I asked a question earlier, but I think the, uh, the targets are coming together. They are to deal with the environment, and, and that just doesn't include uh, energy security, which we're covering uh, later on, but water and logistics as well. I think logistics is a, a, a very important subject which we uh, should cover. We are going to pick that up yeah, in a break. We I will, and sure. the other one would be uh, the uh, economics for an aging uh, population. I think that's that's something that, that particularly concerns uh, not only Japan. Do you think you're addressing this urgently enough, Minister, the economics for an aging population and also the skills and the, the, the this issue which both David and Glenn have brought up, which is not unique to Japan, of course? 
So I think this, this is still the uh, ongoing debate for uh, less than just... But is it urgent enough, given the, the scale of the problem? Uh, thinking about uh, uh, population uh, demographic, the, you know, I think this is not enough, but I think e even opening up the con countries, I, I don't know the definition of opening up, but it's finally depends on the each people whether to come to Japan or not. So that's why I think, uh, uh, rather than just uh, uh, simply attacking on attack, tackling on the immigration only, but uh, you know, powering more power on those uh, activate, activating all those unworking force is uh, the priorities. We of course, of course yeah. a massive problem, like yeah. in the European Union, we're debating it, and of course, in countries like my own, it's, it's convulsing politics at the moment. Final thought, Robert, please. Um, yeah, on the question of whether there's enough urgency in dealing with the demographics and energy as well. Unfortunately, particularly on the demographics, my answer is no. And the evidence is very clear because we just had a report from the Social Security Reform Commission in early August. And that report really does not even begin to scratch the surface on the amount of cost control that's necessary in the Social Security system. When that law was passed last year, they agreed that they would hike the consumption tax and improve the uh, efficiency, they say, of the Social Security system. But the report that came out, unfortunately, I'm sure uh, Professor Seke tried very hard, but that report is simply inadequate. It's just not good enough. We need a much, much more serious attack on the issue of uh, how large Social Security payments are going to be. I mean, we're, you know, two-thirds of total government spending now is on social programs. How are you going to have a, a country that's sustainable if it's already two-thirds and you've got more aging? The issue is not the demographics, it's how society responds to the demographics. And that report indicates to me that we have not responded quickly enough. Unfortunately, Japan is not alone in this. The US hasn't done a good job, Europe hasn't done a good job, and that's why per perhaps Professor Komiyama's point is, if we can get this right, then Japan is an example for the world. But I haven't seen this. In this a long way to go, yet. okay. Yeah. Yoshi, quick comment. Okay, um, I'm optimistic, because like uh, all the leaders of Japan are in in their 50s, like uh, Mr. Hayashi is uh, 51, 52, and uh, uh, Prime Minister is in, is in his 50s. All the important ministers have become much younger. At the same time, because the Olympics 2020 will have a boost in terms of the economy, I used to be not a little bit more skeptical about the future, but right now we have become so much optimistic about the economy and as well as the reform that uh, Prime Minister Abe is doing and strong leadership he has shown for getting Olympics as well as on tackling the, the uh, regulations and also changing and liberalizing. And we are very hopeful for the future. Thank you. The trouble is there will be aging ministers in seven years' time <laughs> for the Olympics. But still younger generation coming up and they're quite strong as well. Maybe there should be aging ministers, uh, a race for aging ministers in the Tokyo Olympics. All right, well look, thank you very much indeed. As always happens, you're all beginning to really come alive with ideas on healthcare and other things, uh, which I haven't been able to get, get through. So thank you very much, and let's try and pick them up later. I have to say that Takuma Maeda has come up with a fourth arrow, education strategy. So let me thank you all, particularly, uh, is anyone burning to say anything as if, you know, I've ignored you completely? And we understand the business about gender, which uh, I take, take on board. It's something which uh, has to be tackled on every panel everywhere in the world. So thank you once again for raising that. We've got to 10.30 or 10.33. So the floor is yours, Yoshi. Thank you very much, Mr. Galvin. And then uh, please give our panelists a big round of applause again. Thank you. That was great. Thank you very much.